And John Fung used to comment that there are three stages to meditation. First is learning how to do it. The second is learning how to maintain it. Here he's talking about concentration. And the third is learning how to put it to use. You can hear the instructions and focus on the breath. Anybody can focus on the breath. What makes the difference is the maintaining. How do you stick with it? And this applies not only to concentration practice, but to the practice as a whole. We live in an environment that's not all that friendly to Dharma practice. It's almost as if we're in a moon colony. Step outside of the moon colony and you explode. So we have to learn how to nourish our practice as best we can in difficult situations. And to some extent this is true wherever you go. The true practice of the Dharma is countercultural, even in Buddhist countries. There's more support there, there's more understanding. But the Buddhist countries have also developed their ways of resisting the practice. So it's not like it's easy for anybody. Fortunately, the Buddha gave some instructions on how to maintain your practice. He said there are two important things, internally and externally. The external quality he said that is most helpful for gaining awakening or getting your first taste of awakening is what he calls admirable friendship. The internal quality is appropriate attention. With admirable friendship, it means finding someone who's an admirable friend, but also the fact that you en enter into an admirable friendship with that person. An admirable friend is recognized by four qualities. The first is that this person is a person of conviction, really believes in the Buddha's awakening. What does that mean? How is that relevant to you? Well, basically, the Buddha gained awakening through his own efforts. And one of the things he awakened to was the nature of human effort, what it can do. And so to have conviction in the Buddha's awakening is to be convinced that you can make a difference through your own actions. The basic principle is if you act on skillful intentions, if you act on skillful intentions, you'll get good results. If you act on unskillful intentions, you get bad results. And obviously, someone who believes this is someone you can trust. People who believe that their actions don't make any difference, it doesn't matter what you do, or what you, there is no good or evil. You can't trust people like that. So you start with someone who believes in the principle that your actions really do make a difference, and it's really important how you choose your intentions to act on. The second quality is virtue. If people are really serious about their intentions, then they want to make sure that, that they act in a way that doesn't harm anybody. This is expressed in the five precepts. No killing, no stealing, no illicit sex, no lying, no taking of intoxicants. The third quality is generosity. This means generous, being generous with material things, but also being generous with being generous with the Dharma. Being generous with your time, being generous with your knowledge, being generous with your energy, being generous with your forgiveness. And then the fourth quality is really one of the someone who's wise and discerning, and particularly who really understands why it is that we suffer and how we can put an end to that suffering. Now, obviously, these characteristics are found best in someone who's gained the first taste of awakening. Their conviction in the Buddha has been confirmed. Their discernment into the problem of suffering has finally taken root. And based on both of those qualities, then they're generous and they're virtuous. Now, to enter into an admirable fr friendship with this sort of person means not only that you look for someone who has these qualities, you also want to look for someone who encourages other people to develop these qualities, because they'll, of course they'll try to encourage you, and then you try to emulate those qualities yourself. 
you become a person of conviction, generosity, virtue, and discernment. And that's how this external quality helps you maintain your energy on the path. Conviction of these is probably the most important. If you're not convinced that the Buddha is really awakened, it's very easy to start thinking, well, maybe he was just somebody who had some interesting ideas 2,600 years ago, but there are a lot of other people who have interesting ideas. And you can start wandering around. And the path begins to lose a lot of its fervor, lose a lot of its energy. Or you might say, well, that was 2,600 years ago. How does that apply now? We live in a different environment. We live in a different world. But you have to remember, greed, aversion, and delusion then and greed, aversion, and delusion now are the same sorts of things. And the good qualities of the path are also the same sorts of things. There are certain things that don't change. And the Buddha was able to see these things clearly and map them all out. So in terms of looking for the question of what is skillful and what's not, we don't have to keep on reinventing the drama wheel all the time. We've got some guidance. And then, of course, the Buddha teaches us to develop our own discernment so that in the areas where he doesn't give guidance, we can take the basic principles and learn how to apply them ourselves, learn from our mistakes. So that our good intentions become more and more skillful intentions, based not only on wanting to do something good, but also understanding, well, what actually is effective, what actually is helpful, what actually is harmless. And this gets into the internal quality that's most useful, which is what Buddha calls appropriate attention. This means basically looking at things in terms of what's skillful and what's not. And what can I do to develop what's skillful, and what can I do to abandon what's not? This principle right here covers the entire dharma. There was a layperson one time who was asked by some sectarians, what does this Buddha of yours teach? Does he teach that the universe is eternal or not eternal? And the layperson said, well, no, he didn't answer that question. How about if it's finite or infinite? No, he didn't answer that one either. Is the soul the same thing as the body? Is it something different from the body? No, he didn't answer that one either. They just went down the list of what were the hot topics at that time. In every case, you know, the Buddha doesn't address those issues. So I said, well, this Buddha of yours, he's a, he's a nihilist. He doesn't teach anything. He teaches nothing. And the lay person said, no. He teaches what's skillful and what's unskillful. He teaches to do what's skillful and to bend what's unskillful. That was the end of that conversation. The lay person went to see the Buddha, and the Buddha confirmed that, yes, that's the right thing to say in a situation like that. And so appropriate attention is paying attention to what you're doing with that question in mind. What is skillful? What is unskillful? What can I do if I'm inclined to do something unskillful? What can I do to learn how to do what's skillful? When I'm already doing something skillful, how can I maintain it? And then you develop this way of looking at things until it turns into the Four Noble Truths. Unskillful action would be craving, the three types of craving. Of course, the results of unskillful actions would be suffering. Skillful actions would be the Noble Eightfold Path. The results would be you put an end to suffering by putting an end to craving. So learning how to look at your life in those terms. That's appropriate attention, and that's what's going to help you gain awakening. Now, the problem is that we look at our lives in so many other terms. Our jobs require that we look at things in different ways. Our family life, members of the family demand that we look at things in different ways. And so you have to learn how to talk to yourself, to remind yourself, okay, these are your real values. There's just a lot in the path that doesn't show its results right away. And it's very easy to get waylaid by the views and opinions of the world. And so this is where those three types of fabrication come in that we've been talking about. One is you learn how to breathe in a comfortable way. It gives you a sense of well-being, being on the path. Viscerally, it feels good. You're in difficult situations, but you can learn how to breathe in a way that doesn't add to the difficulty. 
That keeps reminding you, okay, where did you learn this technique? Well, you learned it from the Buddha. Okay, remember the other things the Buddha taught. And you learn to talk to yourself, address issues that are related to the Dharma. This is where the issue of doubt comes in, the healthy doubt that wants to know. The Buddha talks about right concentration. What is right concentration like? He talks about the stages of noble attainments. What are those like? I mean, there's so many other things that the world would like us to be curious about. And this is what this kind of doubt is. The doubt that wants to know is basically curiosity. The world wants us to be curious about the things that they have to sell us, or whatever they want to get out of us. And the Buddha wants you to be curious about things that are for your own good. You want to be curious about why is it that we all want happiness, and yet we do things again and again and again that create suffering. Where are we blind? What can we do to put an end to that blindness? Thinking those questions, those questions are in line with the Four Noble Truths. And then the perceptions you hold in mind. The world, again, would have us hold in mind perceptions that Success in life means getting ahead, getting a lot of money, getting status. But the Buddha to call these simply the ways of the world. There's gain and there's loss. There's status, loss of status. There's praise and criticism, pleasure and pain. And the world wants us to thirst after these things, the, the status and the gain and the praise and the physical pleasures. But you can't have these positive ones without having the negative ones as well. There's going to be material loss. There's going to be loss of status. There's going to be criticism. There's going to be pain. And what do you do in cases like that? The world pretty much abandons you. They say, well, look for the good things. And if you're suffering, sometimes they say, well, the problem is you. Or maybe it doesn't matter. There are all kinds of ways that the world has of trying to disguise the fact that they're selling you only half of reality. So you have to learn how to hold that perception in mind. Wherever there's gain, there's going to be loss. Wherever there's status, there's going to be loss of status. Why devote your life to pursuing these things? Another good perception to hold in mind. And here we're talking about metal fabrication. It's simply the fact of where there's karma, there's also rebirth. Wherever there's craving, there's going to be rebirth. Where do you want to go? Think of that image of the king. The story goes that the king met up with a young monk one day, and he had known this young monk back when the young monk was still a layperson. He was the son of a wealthy family in the city where the king was king. And he was curious, why would you want to ordain? People usually ordain because they've lost their relatives, they've lost their wealth, they've lost their health. Basically, they've ended up in a pretty miserable situation, so the only out is to ordain. And here you are, you're wealthy, your family's still alive. You're healthy. Why would you ordain? And the monk responded with those four Dhamma summaries that we chanted last night. The world is swept away, it does not endure, offers no shelter, there's no one in charge. One has to pass on, leaving everything behind. The world has nothing of its own. Yet the world is insufficient, insatiable, slave to craving. The first three of those Dhamma summaries relate to the teachings on inconstancy, stress, not self, or aging, illness, death. You see this clearly in the examples that the young monks gives to explain this to the king. First in terms of inconstancy or in aging. He asked the king, when you were young, were you strong? And the king said, yes, I was so strong I couldn't see anybody else who was my equal in strength. How about now? Well, now, no, I'm 80 years old, and sometimes I mean to put my foot in one place and go someplace else. And the monk said, well, that's what I mean. The world is swept away. As for the world has no one in charge, of course, the king felt he was in charge. But the young monk pointed out to him, when you're sick and you've got an illness, 
that sends pain shooting through your body. So that's, and your courtiers, courtiers are gathered around, wondering, is this time you're going to die? This time is he going to die? Can you order them to take out part of that pain and share it so that you don't have to feel so much? Well, no. You, the king had to sh feel all that pain all on his own. Certainly wasn't in charge of that. That's the teaching on stress, the teaching on illness. And then finally, the teaching on death and not self. He said, the world has nothing of its own. And the king says, wait a minute, I've got storerooms filled with gold and silver and all the wealth I could want. But the young monk asks, when you die, can you take it with you? Well, no. I have to leave it all behind and go along, go along in terms of my karma. So here he's got the king reflecting on aging, illness, death, inconstancy, stress, not self. And I guess to the fourth one, the world is insufficient, insatiable, slave to craving. The young monk asks him, suppose there were Canaan to the east, with lots of wealth, all sorts of things that you could gain, and their army is weak. Would you attack them? And the king says, yes. How about a kingdom to the south? Yep, go there for that one too. To the west? Yep. To the north? Yep. How about on the other side of the ocean? Yep. So he's been reflecting on aging, illness, and death, how he can't take anything with him. He's 80 years old. But he would still be willing to attack and kill for the sake of more. This is our problem. We keep coming back. We suffer aging, illness, and death again and again and again, and yet we don't have enough of it. If you hold that perception in mind, it makes it a lot easier to look at the baits of the world, gain, status, praise, physical pleasures. You realize it's not worth it. The relationships you have with other people, they have their, their good side, but they also have their bad side. And you keep coming back for the same thing again and again and again. If you hold in mind the perception, well, this is your one chance to get this, whatever, it's going to be hard to resist. But if you realize, okay, you've been through this many, many times. As the Buddha said, if you see someone who's wealthy, has all the possible power and other things that people crave, remind yourself, you've been there and you've lost it now. And John Fuang once said, when you find yourself really pining after something, especially sen sensory pleasure, tell yourself, you, the reason you're pining for it is you used to have it, and you miss it. You want it again. Of course, think about that. You'll get it again, and you're going to lose it again. That's a good perception to hold in mind. So when you think about the perceptions that the world would have you follow, around yourself, okay, appropriate attention teaches you other perceptions. When you see somebody who's really poor, remind yourself, you've been there too. Do you want to come back to that? The problem is, as you said, We've had these things in the past and we miss them, but there's a sense of nostalgia. The Pali term, analio, no, no nostalgia. That's an important part of letting go of suffering, letting go of the cause of suffering. You learn not to have any nostalgia for your old cravings. As long as there's nostalgia, you still have to fight those perceptions with the perceptions that the Buddha recommends. So here again, you get to learn how to use these three kinds of fabrication. The way you breathe, the way you talk to yourself, the perceptions you hold in mind, feelings of well-being that you can develop, both through the way you breathe and through your perceptions, and through the encouragement you give yourself as you talk to yourself. This is how you develop appropriate attention, the quality that helps keep you on the path, the internal quality that helps keep you on the path. So it's from admirable friends that we learn about and develop appropriate attention inside. And these are the two qualities that help to sustain us. This is why we try to have communities of people to get together, practice together, encourage one another in what's for each person's true well-being. It's hard to find communities like that in the world. 
So when you find one, make the most of it. That's how you sustain yourself on the path. That's how you maintain the path. So you can put it to use to get rid of your own suffering. So it's in the maintaining. That's the hard work. But it's good work. And all those who have devoted themselves to it say that it's worth all the effort. The Buddha himself one time said, Suppose someone would make a deal with you, that they would spear you with a hundred spears in the morning and a hundred spears at noon and a hundred spears in the evening, or three hundred spears in one day, every day for a hundred years. But at the very end you would be guaranteed awakening. And the Buddha said, if there were such a deal that could be offered, it would be good to take it. And when you did gain awakening, you wouldn't think that you'd gained it in pain. The experience of the deathless is that overwhelming. That's special. So do what you can to maintain the path. Nobody's asking you to get speared. There will be difficulties. But learn to look for admirable friends, enter into admirable friendship, and develop appropriate attention the kind of attention to things that helps sustain you on the path, to keep reminding you this is a good path to be on, and it leads to something even better. Those are the two qualities that will see you through.